I'm Richard Walker, Executive Director of the Benjamin Rush Institute. We hope you enjoy today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. This series would not be possible without the support of foundations that endorse the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute, our student chapter members, and individuals like you. Through your support, we are able to continue informing and educating today's medical students about the benefits of patient-centered, doctor-focused methods for the practice of medicine, just like those discussed in this series. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the Benjamin Rush Institute and the medical students we serve. While you're there, please consider a donation to support our educational programs and events just like this one. You can donate by card, check, or by mail. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. We are very fortunate that New York Medical College alumnus, Dr. Peter Bentevegna, reinitiated our chapter. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Bentevegna and have him say a few words and introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Peter? Welcome. Thank you, Tara. And welcome, everyone, to our uh, webinar, the New York Medical College chapter, Benjamin Rush Institute. Benjamin Rush, of course, being one of the founding fathers and the um, founding father of uh, psychiatry. Uh, tonight's meeting uh, is going to feature uh, J. Peter Rubin. Uh, he's an old friend of mine and, uh, and I will go back a long way and I'm so proud of where he's, where he's gone with his life and his career. He is the uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, Dowd Professor of Chair of Plastic Surgery, Director of the Wound Center there, Healing Center, Professor of Bioenge Bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh and also President-Elect of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. He's going to be speaking tonight on his specialty, which has to do with stem cells and regenerative medicine and what that means to us, what that means to our patients, and how that affects the patient uh, relationship with the physician, which is, of course, Benjamin Rush's most important contribution to medicine. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy that you were able to get this done, and we're really uh, proud that you've been be part of our uh, institute here. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, and uh, really just a, a privilege to be here with all of you this evening. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen so that my slides can come up. So I, I got to learn a little bit about the, the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute, and uh, I think Peter summed it up very well with the, the emphasis on the doctor-patient relationship, and, and that, that is so yeah. no sacred. Uh, such an important thing uh, in the practice of medicine. And <clears throat> I'm going to, here we go. Um, I'm going to talk this evening about the science and ethics of stem cells, but very importantly, how cell therapy impacts the doctor-patient relationship, because it, 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 it's very fascinating uh, how this has evolved and the role that this is taking uh, in medicine and some of the ethical controversies uh, that this has uh, brought on. My disclosures will not impact the oops, content sorry. of my talk today. It's uh, talking on its own, that's good. Uh, <laughs> so let me tell you about my, my perspective. Um, so I, I'm a, a clinical plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Uh, I'm a, a basic researcher in the area of adult mesenchymal stem cell biology, and also a translational researcher. So we brought a lot of these therapies uh, into the clinic uh, under FDA auspices. And uh, I also am very involved in our health system. I'm, I'm an administrative leader uh, in uh, what is uh, now a $23 billion health system uh, at uh, UPMC. And uh, so, so I, I have a lot of reach into uh, supply chain and, and kind of the delivery side uh, of what we do. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon, and, uh, you know, th there's nothing more important than sitting face to face with a patient and having an, an honest conversation about uh, what's wrong with them and, and the, the treatment options and what you can possibly deliver uh, to help them. Um, and I I'll tell you what we're not going to talk about today. So this talk is not a discussion on the ethics of embryonic stem cells. That's a completely um, 
you know, sort of tangential issue to this talk uh, and, and has a lot of its own nuances and is very, very important, but, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Um, moreover, uh, this talk is not a condemnation of the use of stem cells in medicine. In fact, I'm a big proponent of the use of stem cells in medicine. My laboratory has been focused on that for uh, almost uh, 20 years. And I've taken a lot of these uh, therapies uh, into, uh, into the clinic, uh, into clinical trials. So I think that there's a lot of promise here uh, with the uh, biology. And this is my lab. This is the Adipose Stem Cell Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, standing next to me is Casey Mara, who is the co-founder uh, of this lab. We started this together in, in 2002, uh, and it's grown to a pretty big enterprise uh, funded by many federal sources, uh, very notably the Department of Defense. And, and we you know, believe in the science behind this, and we believe in the uh, potential. And a lot of our work is, is really focused on uh, improving the lives of our wounded warriors, with, especially with devastating burn injuries, craniofacial injuries, uh, and limb injuries. And I'm not going to really delve too much into the, the work that we're doing uh, specifically, uh, but we, we've done a lot of work helping uh, patients with traumatic amputations who have painful residual limbs. They can't wear a prosthesis. They have phantom pain. Uh, they have chronic inflammation and their function is very, very limited. And, and we uh, have um, uh, just recently finished a clinical trial under Department of Defense funding through the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, treating these patients with adipose-derived uh, autologous stem cells. And we made a big difference in the lives of, of many of these patients, bringing their pain scores down dramatically, helping them to tolerate their prosthetics and be more functional and more mobile. Uh, so I show this, you know, to highlight the fact that that across many, many disciplines, there's real science behind this, and there's real promise uh, behind this uh, as well. Uh, but there are also a lot of ethical issues that have arisen that really impact the doctor-patient relationship. So in this uh, talk, I'm going to first start out with a little bit of, of a review of what are stem cells, and then... Uh, talk a little bit about why stem cell therapies are really vulnerable uh, to illicit use uh, and advertising and, and really show the scope of the problem and then get into some of the ethical issues, uh, informed consent issues, um, the uh, misperceptions of, of, of stem cell research and how that's used inappropriately, uh, medical tourism competency issues, and, and even uh, how in the evolution of these therapies, uh, they bypass the standard uh, doctor-patient relationship. Uh, we'll look at some regulatory issues and then touch on some established ethical guidelines and hopefully have a, uh, uh, a very interesting discussion uh, about some of these points that I'm gonna raise. So what are stem cells? Stem cells are unspecialized cells uh, that divide to maintain their population. So they undergo self-renewal. They have a second characteristic of undergoing asymmetric division where one cell type uh, will terminally differentiate and the other will stay immature. Uh, and they're pluripotent, which means they can give rise to many different tissues. And stem cells come in three basic types, embryonic stem cells. And, and I also ask if, uh, if everyone could please mute your microphones to keep the uh, echo and background noise down. Uh, there are three general types of stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells, uh, which do carry a lot of, of controversy. And again, this talk is not about those issues. Um, uh, there are induced uh, pluripotent cells, which are basically reprogrammed cells uh, that, that can uh, be uh, reprogrammed, uh, fiber, basic fibroblasts or otherwise bland cells uh, through gene therapy to have the characteristics of pluripotent cells. And then there are adult stem cells. And a lot of people don't realize that our bodies are full of adult mesenchymal stem cells. They reside in almost all of our organs and, and they uh, give rise to uh, new end organ cells. They sort of turn over the uh, population. So if we look at the differences between them, uh, pluripotent, uh, totipotent cells uh, that come from embryos uh, can create an entire individual. 
They can create all uh, three germ layers. And, uh, you know, these are very, very um, uh, powerful in their ability to differentiate. Uh, and, and they're used in some therapies, but they're, you know, quite restricted uh, in their use and, and in their uh, uh, investigational use and, and research projects. Uh, but they can actually give rise to an entire uh, individual. IPS cells are genetically reprogrammed uh, to uh, have the characteristics of embryonic stem cells. Uh, however, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're actually just made in a laboratory. And uh, this was uh, really brought to the forefront by uh, John Gurdon and uh, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for showing that you can put uh, different genes into otherwise uh, ordinary cells and get them to behave uh, with pluripotency. So, so this is something that's very, very promising. Uh, and there are a few trials going on with iPS cells, uh, especially now with CRISPR-Cas technology, where you can do a lot of gene editing. Uh, I think we're going to hear a lot more about this. Uh, but both embryonic stem cells and iPS cells are, are a little bit hard to get. And um, they, they all have you know, sort of different problems. iPS cells, interestingly, some of the genes that uh, are used to transfect those cells are actually oncogenes. So that they actually are, are genes that are associated with different cancer uh, pathways. Now adult stem cells. So adult stem cells are sort of everywhere. They're very easy to get and they uh, live in all of our tissues and they give rise to the end organ cells. They, they uh, will assist in turning over uh, the cells in, in most of our organs when stimulated to grow. And adult stem cells uh, are pretty easy to get a hold of, especially from tissues like fat uh, or bone marrow. Uh, in fact, bone marrow stem cells are our uh, quintessential uh, uh, adult mesenchymal stem cell, and they've been used for many decades now. And uh, these cells can uh, differentiate not as robustly as uh, embryonic stem cells, uh, but they can form a lot of tissue lineages. They can form blood, they can form uh, bone, they can form cartilage, you know, most of the mesenchymal uh, lineages. And this is what my lab studies. We study adipose-derived stem cells. And like bone marrow, uh, these cells can be forced uh, with a lot of growth factors in, in culture uh, to turn into many different tissue types. So they have a lot of potential, and these are very interesting cells uh, to work with. Um, while everyone's kind of interested in what these cells can turn into in terms of different tissue types, the real value of these cells for therapeutic use is in the growth factors that they release. So the, the concept is that you put these stem cells into the body and they release a lot of uh, beneficial growth factors that may serve to help reset the immune system uh, or heal difficult wounds. Uh, and, and that's what these are mostly uh, used for uh, therapeutically. And some of the growth factors they, they release are vasculogenic growth factors, generalized growth factors like hepatocyte growth factor. Uh, so th these are all things that can be released uh, from these cells and why they are uh, so interesting uh, to, to scientists and, and clinicians. So here's where things start to get interesting. So a majority of marketed therapies use adult stem cells. Why? Uh, because they're pretty easy to get. And they can be autologous stem cells uh, or they can be allogenic, but either way, uh, they're just pretty easy to get. And because they're so easy to get, there are very low barriers to entry uh, for clinics to start practicing with them. Additionally, there are multiple clinical targets across the body, everything from neurologic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and the people uh, who use these cells in many of the illicit clinics really prey on the hopes of patients with disabling diseases. So if you have an incurable MS or, or a, uh, other neurologic diseases, 
uh, that are very debilitating, uh, these folks will reach out to you and they, they will kind of uh, touch you uh, with stories of people who have gotten better anecdotally and, 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 and you know, these are people who are willing to try anything. And of course, the whole idea of stem cells are, are so appealing to the public. I mean, they're scientifically fascinating. They're sort of uh, futuristic and, and a little bit of sci-fi uh, added in there. Uh, so how do we get stem cells out of tissue? Well, he, here's one way we can do it is simply by doing liposuction. So here's me with a pot of fat uh, that I remove by liposuction. I, I affectionately call liquid gold. And through enzymatic digestion uh, in a very severe, very simple laboratory procedure, uh, you can isolate uh, stem cell populations, stromal cell populations, we, we call them. And these are cells that are devoid of the, of the lipid uh, droplets. Uh, so they're, they, they're not lipid laden cells. Uh, and some of them are just bland fibroblasts, but a lot of them have uh, multi lineage potential. Uh, and this isolation can be done at the point of care in about 60 to 90 minutes. So now you have really ac uh, very easy access uh, to these cell populations. Additionally, there are actually automated machines that can do that separation for you. Now, none of these are approved for clinical use in the US. Uh, these are all considered research devices, uh, but there are a lot of people who, who use them um, in, in ways that are, are not consistent with the labeling and not consistent with the regulation. It's not even off-label use because they aren't even approved for any clinical use. So there's really nothing off-label off about it. Uh, additionally, many human tissues are sold uh, mostly in a legal manner by commercial tissue banks. And commercial tissue banking, that's a, a huge multi-billion dollar industry uh, where, and I'm not talking about kidneys and livers and solid organs, I'm talking about uh, bone paste, bone cements, heart valves, uh, all, all of these uh, sort of little spare parts uh, that are stored and sold by tissue banks uh, for different reconstructive purposes across the, the body. Uh, heavy use in orthopedics, heavy use in plastic surgery, heavy use in cardiovascular, uh, but this is a, you know, a big and legal business. Uh, there are some labs that, that sell tissues uh, that are not regulated by the FDA and are kind of, you know, in, in a gray area. Uh, but again, th this makes these tissues very easy to get. So this is a, a very interesting graph from a paper uh, that, that was describing the direct-to-consumer stem cell business in the Southwest US where uh, a lot of these clinics uh, uh, are in place. And if you look at the different cells, uh, first, if when you look at adipose tissue, uh, most of this bar is light gray, which is autologous, which means that the fat is just being you know, harvested from the individual patient and processed. Uh, and there are all these other tissues, so amniotic tissue. So this is really in vogue right now. And this is sold by a lot of tissue banks. They get placentas uh, legally uh, donated from, from uh, you know, live births, uh, nothing embryonic about it. And uh, these are used uh, uh, to treat different wounds and different disorders. Uh, bone marrow, again, mostly autologous here. Uh, and it raises a very interesting ethical issue because patients, the, the doctors who do this will tell patients, look, these are your cells. This is your tissue. How in the world are you going to let anyone tell you that it's not okay to use your own tissues? Uh, but I'll, I'll get to the why behind that um, a little later, because it's not so simple uh, as a uh, you know, right to autonomy, uh, that as, uh, as you might think, as outlined in the Belmont principles. So you really have a perfect storm here. You have cells with very interesting scientific potential, multiple clinical targets across the body, uh, especially hard to treat disorders, a public fascination, great fodder for the media. The media loves anything about stem cells and the ads are everywhere. Now add to the mix that, you know, all of our favorite celebrities and sports heroes are, are jumping on the bandwagon and, and they're getting uh, these different therapies. Uh, this is a website uh, from one of the uh, uh, stem cell clinics. And they have a whole list of, of celebrities, uh, celebrities, you know, Governor Rick Perry from Texas, who 
who went to stem cell clinics. So therefore, uh, if all the celebrities are doing it, then the implication is that it's, it's really you know, fine for the, uh, uh, for the average person. And when you look at the scope of the problem, it's actually pretty big in the United States. So this was a search. Uh, this slide is 10 years old. And this is 2011 Google search. There are you know, 11 million results when you Google stem cell treatment. This is the updated slide from over the weekend. And there are you know, 500 million results when you enter stem cell treatments. So this is still very, 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 very popular. And you know, look at some of the ads and you know, reverse aging by 10 years, um, you know, fire beware uh, on this stuff. So as of May, 2017, uh, in, in one of the publications looking at this problem, there were 716 clinics in the US. Uh, and that number is probably higher right now. About two thirds of these are in um, the Southern US, uh, especially the Southwest, where there are real, real clusters of these clinics, but they're sort of everywhere. And, and they're in everyone's town right now, in, including Pittsburgh. And these are all of the different disorders that they treat. So you look at their websites and they're treating you know, autism, uh, different cancer, you know, diabetes, uh, muscular dystrophy. Uh, it, it's almost hard to believe, you know, that, that people are kind of drinking their own Kool-Aid on this. And, and it's basically, so the same cells uh, that you get out of the fat tissue uh, used the same way are going to treat all of these different disorders. And, and that's, again, it's a little bit hard to, hard to believe, but that's what these clinics uh, will advertise. And the direct to consumer ads are everywhere. Uh, again, they're looking for people, they're playing uh, on people's hopes and, and fears. And these are the characteristics of the ads that you see. Hyped up claims of efficacy. Uh, and in fact, what they love is they love uh, patient stories, anecdotal evidence. Uh, they all downplay the risks of the procedure saying they're less invasive and less risky. Uh, all supported by testimonials, and you never actually see any real data uh, coming from those 716 rogue clinics. So this has sort of become the snake oil uh, of our day. And again, when, when you look at all of these disorders treated by, by the same isolate of bone marrow cells, uh, or adipose-derived stem cells, or amniotic uh, cells, uh, it, it, you know, your radar kind of goes up as a physician or a scientist or, or even just a, a person with any reasonable, reasonableness uh, that uh, this almost seems too good to be true. You know, quite a list. So now let, let's talk about some of the other ethical issues that come into play besides spurious claims made. And one is the informed consent issue. So by legal terms, lack of informed consent is actually battery. Uh, and physicians have a responsibility to disclose information material to the, to the decision of the patient to undergo uh, treatment. But it's really hard to do that when you don't have any evidence, real evidence, or you don't have any data behind uh, the treatments that you're doing. And, and that's a big problem. You also need to have a, a very frank discussion with your patient about the risks. And again, that's also very hard to do uh, if, if you're downplaying the risks, as well as alternatives. And this is a huge threat to the doctor-patient relationship is the fact that uh, a lot of the physicians doing these therapies are, are generalists at best, and they're not in a position to really talk about the alternatives uh, to therapy in, in a material manner. I mean, they could say, well, you can go see someone who will do surgery, but this is minimally invasive. And then of course you wanna have a truthful record of, of efficacy. And a lot of these things are just not offered 
uh, when you get down to informed consent with, with some of these stem cell therapies in, in these uh, unregulated clinics. And there are real risks. So this is, a, you know, it was a real report. There were three patients that were treated uh, in a, uh, a clinic in Florida. And all three of them had uh, macular degeneration. All three of them were treated. There wasn't even an ophthalmologist on site. And all three of them were treated uh, with autologous adipose tissue, uh, stem cells, untested, unregulated, unproven. And you know what? The stem cells actually survived very well in the retina. In fact, so well that they made a sheet, an opaque sheet uh, on the retinas of these patients. So all three of these patients were blinded. And by the way, all of these patients had both eyes treated at the same time, which you know, belies common sense. You know, how often would you have both hips done at the same time with an orthopod do that? So it, none of that really made sense. So there are real risks to these therapies. They're not so benign. Now let's talk about the ethics of, of research because a lot of, of these clinics will say that they're doing these treatments under a research protocol. And now we have some real hazards. One is that it's possible for patients to waive a lot of their rights on a research informed consent. Secondly, there's this whole issue of patient funded research. Well, it, it is research, it's a research study, uh, but Mrs. Jones, um, it, it's patient funded. So if you wanna have the treatment, then you know if you wanna be in the study, you need to pay for it. So do you think Mrs. Jones is gonna pay $5,000 uh, to be in the you know, placebo control arm? Well, of course not. You know, so they do it as a cohort study. And then there, there are scientific issues behind it. So this is a real issue of patient-funded research, and it, it should really uh, not be allowed. Uh, then there are issues of coercion uh, that, that come along with these research studies and pressure uh, to participate. And then the therapeutic misconception. So it's very easy if you're running a research trial to pitch it as something that's going to help you, when in fact, uh, the definition of research is we don't know what's gonna happen. But you can have someone telling a patient, oh yeah, of course, this, this research experimental therapy, this is gonna help. The therapeutic misconception in research is that patients are agreeing to participate because they have this misconception uh, that they're getting an effective treatment when in fact it is just research. And a lot of clinics use this, uh, but wait, it gets worse. This is um, clinicaltrials.gov. And it is run by the United States NIH. So it's run by our government. Now, anyone in the world, and they do, can post their clinical trial on clinicaltrials.gov. So you actually have clinical trials from, you name the country, uh, that are posted here because this is informational and it implies that there's credibility. So you can actually be running a clinical trial offshore in the Caribbean where the regulations are, are a little bit lax uh, and you can still post it on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, so that's a big, a big problem. It is a, uh, a service of the NIH, and, and, but you know, it's, it's really misused a lot uh, to advertise trials and try to give them credibility. Now, what about medical tourism? So I mentioned clinics in the Caribbean or maybe in South America, uh, and this is a real problem as well. Uh, actually, in plastic surgery, we see a lot of patients who go down to, to South America or Mexico to have cosmetic procedures, and they come back with terrible problems, and we end up having to take care of them. Um, so the perceived benefits are that, uh, you know, you're getting a therapy that you just can't get at home. You get special expertise. And a lot of times, yes, it's, it's cheaper. A lot of times it is pretty cheap. And you combine that with a trip to a really cool place. Uh, but things don't always work out very well when you go to those clinics. Uh, and there are competency issues, you know, all over uh, the world, uh, Thailand, uh, Hong Kong. I mean, you know, people are 
are really uh, seeing the risks of this uh, and, and getting hurt, you know, and, and, and it may not even be a physician who's doing that. I mean, it could literally be an aesthetician, a beautician uh, who is, um, you know, doing these, uh, uh, these therapies and, and administering biologics. So I, I mentioned that this can also bypass the traditional standard of care practice models. And very importantly, it can bypass uh, traditional doctor-patient relationships. And this is key to understand. So when you look at, um, when you look at how these clinics operate and versus the standard of care, it's very different. So here's a, a patient with some you know, disorder uh, let's say an orthopedic issue, you know, bad arthritis of the wrist, goes to see uh, their PCP, their, their family doctor who they trust. And the family doctor says, okay, you, you need to see a, a hand specialist. Uh, and they go and see a specialist. And that specialist is, is really trained to evaluate that person and have an honest discussion with them about the severity of their, of their disorder, about their diagnosis, and talk about all the different treatment options that can be applied, including regenerative medicine options, including stem cell therapies. Where do these fit in? And, and this, is, you know, this is not a bad model. Uh, it actually works, works pretty well because you end up in the hands of the person, uh, ideally, uh, with really good expertise who can have that really good discussion with you about different treatment options uh, because they're a specialist because they really understand that disease process. So this is what happens when you go to a stem, a stem cell clinic, one of those 716 clinics. Uh, you show up there and guess what you get? You get stem cells. Guess what they talk about? They talk about stem cells. And, and they talk about the fact that, you know, you could go see a, uh, a hand surgeon, a plastic, uh, hand surgeon or orthopedic hand surgeon, uh, and they're probably gonna wanna operate on them. So why would you wanna have surgery when you can have stem cells? And uh, you know, we, we can treat whatever ails you uh, with that. So it bypasses uh, that, that pattern of evaluation and really compromises the doctor-patient relationship. And that is the problem with that clinic model is that you, know, you go to a stem cell clinic, no matter what you, uh, disorder you show up with, uh, you're going to be offered stem cells because that's all they got. And they actually don't have the expertise to tell you, uh, look, nothing short of, of surgery is going to make a difference for you because, you know, you, your, your uh, you know, cartilage is gone. You're, you know, you, you've got a problem that just can't be fixed uh, without surgery or, or, you know, some other therapy. They'll be able to, to put everything in context for you. And that's very important. And you know, yet these clinics have slogans like experience you can trust and learn more. Look, they're going to treat your neurologic conditions, their, your orthopedic conditions, your cardiac pulmonary disease. So go to one of these clinics and try to find, ask for the neurologist, ask for the cardiologist. There, there is none. You know, you got one guy, this guy here, uh, you know, kind of pitching all of this different stuff and treating all of these different disorders uh, with essentially the same therapy. And, and how can you possibly have a good doctor-patient relationship uh, when, when, you know, when you have that situation? So the characteristics of these clinics are that they, they don't really have specialists. They often don't have specialists in the field. Uh, there, there are some exceptions. I mean, there are some of these, some of these clinics are very orthopedic uh, uh, focused. Uh, and they, they may have a physiatrist or, or someone with some expertise in the air, in that field. Um, but for the most part, you know, you, you can't go in there and, and uh, find a cardiologist or find a neurologist or a neurosurgeon. Uh, yes, you pay out of pocket. Uh, and it, it's pretty rare that the practitioners or the facilities are going to be regulated beyond uh, basic uh, licensure, uh, if that. And now let's look at some regulatory issues because this gets very interesting. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is sort of a, a whole you know, two-hour uh, slideshow of, of FDA regulation of, 
of stem cells and tissue products. Uh, but there are essentially three regulatory tiers that the FDA uh, uses to classify biologic agents like cell therapy. And in the highest risk category, they actually consider the tissue or the cells to be like a, a drug, a biologic drug. And you have to go through clinical trials and get a biologic license to use it. In the next level down, this is kind of a moderate risk category. It's human cell and tissue category. And this category was really created by the government under the Public Health Service Act, Section 361, to control the spread of communicable diseases. So this is the regulatory classification that tissue banks work under. So you have tissue, you take it out of the body, you don't do a lot to it. You just sort of preserve it. You take a heart valve and you preserve it uh, and, and a tissue bank can sell it and they package it and sell it. And that's sort of a moderate level of risk. And this is the level of regulation where a lot of these amniotic materials come, come out and they sell them in packages and, and any clinic can get a hold of them. Now there's a, a third tier, the practice of medicine. And the FDA does not actually regulate the practice of medicine. That's a state board. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're not regulated in one or two, then you're in, you know, number three, you're practicing medicine. However, th there's really a big um, controversy over what is the practice of medicine. So a lot of these stem cell clinics say that, well, we're not doing stem cell therapy, we're just practicing medicine because we're taking your own fat cells and we're taking them out of your body and we're injecting them somewhere else. Therefore, all we're doing is practicing medicine. And by the way, the FDA has nothing to do with this. And they, they have websites that say, this is not approved by the FDA. Uh, this, is, this is our own center in Pittsburgh, you know, the Pittsburgh Stem Cell Institute. Um, I can tell you that, uh, that this guy is not board certified in anything, and uh, it's well known, uh, no real board, no ABMS board, and uh, you know he's got these flashy websites, and look at this, is stem cell therapy approved by the FDA? No, it's in the practice of medicine. This is actually not true. This is not anywhere tr you know, consistent with federal regs says the FDA does not object to or regulate medical procedures using adult stem cells when they are performed by qualified licensed physicians. So uh, it's actually not in any way true, uh, but all these folks say this. And the FDA for a long time has been wary of this. And there is a clinic in um, Colorado and the FDA in investigated the clinic and said, you guys are not, not are you, uh, 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 you're not only, you know, disregarding uh, the law, but we don't even think that you're doing it safely. We don't even think that you're, you're adhering to proper labeling, to proper processing of the cells, to proper sterility. Uh, and, and they shut them down. They sent them a letter and said, you know, you can't do this anymore. Uh, so uh, they turned around and they sued the federal government. They countersued, they, they, sorry, they sued the federal government and they said, no, we're, we're just practicing uh, medicine and that the FDA is overstepping its authority. And that was a very interesting case uh, because the law was really clear and these folks sued the federal government and then they were hit with a, a permanent injunction. Uh, so this doc is practicing uh, uh, um, offshore uh, right now, uh, but the FDA really does pay attention to it. And then in 2017, uh, the FDA actually set up a new framework to help people who had real therapies uh, that had scientific validity to get them through on a fast track. And they set up a whole new fast track called RMAP, uh, the Regenerative Medicine Advanced uh, Therapeutics uh, Pathway. And in 2017, they said, hey, all you guys out there making these stem cell therapies, get your act together, go through the right pathways. Uh, and we'll help you out. And they actually have a, a what they called a three-year non-enforcement effort. You know, so for three years uh, that they said, we're not gonna go after you, but we want you to make preparations uh, to start putting this through the proper regulatory channels. 
and and they actually extended it a little bit, uh, but that non-enforcement period is going to end, uh, I think, at the end of, of this May of, of this month. So uh, that whole idea of practicing, you know, we're just practicing medicine, we can do whatever we want, or, or Mrs. Jones, these are your cells, so, you know, the government can't tell you what to do with them. Well, it's, it's a safety issue. You know, you take these cells out, you process them with enzymes uh, in a manner that, that may or may not be safe uh, and effective. Uh, you can't just sort of do anything, you know, and in fact, the law is very specific that once the tissue comes out of the body, it does fall under federal regulation. And start looking around at established ethical guidelines. And this is our plastic surgery society. You know, you, you shouldn't be making spurious uh, claims. You shouldn't be uh, appealing to a lay person's fears, anxieties, or emotional vulnerabilities. Um, American College of Surgeons, you know, advertising should be truthful. Uh, PA State Medical Board advertising uh, should be uh, truthful, not uh, intended to deceive the public. You know, so a lot of professional societies, um, you know, if you look at their ethical guidelines, it's pretty clear uh, what you should be doing and, and, and what you shouldn't be doing. Um, so I've kind of walked through a lot of the, you know, the bad side of stem cell therapy uh, and how this can impact the doctor-patient relationship. And I do this as a great proponent of this science and technology, but it, it's got to be real. It's got to be ready for prime time. We can't overhype things. I mean, I want this to succeed and I want this field to be credible through good science and ethical practice so it doesn't become incredible. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, people out there uh, who are really um, kind of abusing uh, these concepts and abusing these principles. And that becomes very, very detrimental to the doctor's pa patient relationship because it erodes trust. And it, it, it can hurt people if taken to the extreme. It can really hurt people because of the risks uh, from this. So uh, let's make, uh, make sure that stem cells are, are not the snake oil of our day, that we back this up with uh, good science and good credibility. So I, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm, I'm happy to open this up to discussion. Uh, wonderful that we have uh, almost 40 people in the, in the virtual room. Uh, of course, I wish I could be there with you in person. Uh, but I'm going to stop here and uh, open up for discussion. Hopefully, this has been a little bit thought-provoking. Uh, thought Th thank you, Dr. Rubin. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, indicate so in the chat box, and I will call on you so that you could ask Dr. Rubin any questions you might have. I do have a question. Uh, Peter, as you know, the, in orthopedics, uh, particularly the different tendonitis problems, whether it be your Achilles tendon or your tennis elbow or your or your uh, <clears throat> golfer's elbow, uh, we all have folks in the community that are injecting uh, uh, PRP or even stem cells fat. Uh, we've seen lots of articles about it. Uh, it doesn't seem like we've got the uh, double blind prospective five year, 10 year outcome yet, even though it's been going on for so long. Why, why don't we have that study that says this actually works or doesn't? That's a great question. And, and the simple answer is because the, the people who are, uh, who are selling the technology to make the products available don't need it. And, and maybe they don't want it. So I, I think that for PRP actually has a pretty good track record. I think there's a lot more data being accumulated for PRP. Uh, and even for adipose for orthopedics, uh, we're, we're starting to see some randomized controlled clinical trials because that's what we really need. I mean, it, it's at a point where uh, I don't think it's been done because people may have been able to get away without it. But I think once the FDA starts really cracking down, uh, as they're promising to uh, at the end of this month, uh, we're going to see you know, more data coming out because that, that's the real difference is the data. Thank you. We have a few questions coming in. Um, Ralph, Great. do you have a question if you'd like to ask Dr. Rubin? Um, hi, a very interesting talk. Thanks for sharing it with us. I was wondering how long can stem cells stay viable uh, on the shelf, ex vivo? Um, I, I was under the impression they can't last more than 24 hours, but I could be well, wrong. 
you know, put them at room temperature, you're looking at 24 to 48 hours. Uh, put them at uh, negative eight or in liquid nitrogen in decades. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, they actually freeze down very well. I mean, we have a whole stem cell bank in our lab and, um, you know, clinical stem cell banking uh, uses, uh, puts them in liquid nitrogen and, and they can stay around for a really long time. That's the whole premise behind, you know, cord blood preservation that we, that we do for, for babies that are being born is, is that you can put them in the freezer and, and they can be around for decades if you need them later. Thank you. Um, Dr. Neil Schluger has a question. Hi, thanks very much for the talk. Um, very interesting. I have a question. You, you know, you, I, I'm in total agreement with you about the, the need to, in a sense, protect consumers and patients from uh, uh, spurious therapies and snake oil salesmen. But what about the recent emergence of these so-called right to try laws? Doesn't that kind of undermine part of this enterprise uh, um, by essentially giving people access to all sorts of experimental therapies, 90% of which are, are going to be shown either not to work or to be harmful and, and would never make it all the way through phase three. Haven't we kind of undermined our own system of, of protecting uh, patients? Yeah, I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly, you know, that, that uh, uh, I, I think it's not about so much about right to try as much as it's about um, making sure that whatever you're trying is honestly presented and uh, you know these, these 716 clinics out there I mean they're, they're you know they're businesses they're going concerns and um, they they uh, but I, I agree completely I mean I think you can't undermine the system and and say on one hand don't do this on the other hand it's a you know it's a person's right to person's right to try as a doc I mean we have a responsibility we got to be able to look our patients in the eye and say uh, I'm pretty confident this is going to help you more than it's going to hurt you. And I can tell you honestly uh, what we know about the risks and benefits. I think a lot of times these things are just overhyped. I mean, I, I, I went uh, in my own community uh, to one of these uh, incognito to one of these, you know, lectures by a, a stem cell guy. And, you know, he's a family practice doc and he uses, uh, you know, amniotic, you know, Wharton's jelly. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a whole room it was a you know a sea of of gray and blue hair you know medicare patients with failing this and failing that and hearing aids just kind of soaking this in dr um suzanne khan has a question we just had a question um if stem cell if anything has been proven to work in arthritis such as si joint or low back pain if those are some of the applications that people are working on yeah, probably those are some of, I think, some of the more promising applications. And, uh, you know, that's an area where, uh, you know, certainly bone marrow stem cells, adipose stem cells, uh, plus minus PRP, uh, where, where they've, they've shown some more promise, but the data are still evolving. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ro uh, Robert Klein, do you have a question? Uh, yes, my, my uh, yes, question is, uh, yeah, is uh, similar. Uh, uh, what do you find as the most uh, promising, promising area of stem cell use, use in the, cell the, use in the uh, future? Um, most promising area? Most promising yes. Area. Uh, I, 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 I think a couple of areas. One is, um, is musculoskeletal. And I, and I think that's an area because of the anti-inflammatory properties uh, of these of these uh, stem cells, especially adult mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, it, both bone marrow and adipose uh, really downregulate inflammatory responses. That that's an area where we're starting to see uh, see some real promise. You know, is in the musculoskeletal uh, areas without you know without question. And then in, in terms of scarring, tissue healing. Uh, even chronic pain, some of the uh, injuries that I deal with and the uh, that are funded by the Department of Defense, that's another area where things are fairly, uh, fairly promising. And then, of course, there are all kinds of trials going on for, uh, for Parkinson's, and these are FDA approved trials. I mean, again, in, in the, the real science behind it, we're, we're seeing some interesting things, stroke, um, Parkinson's, 
some chronic, uh, other chronic degenerative neurologic diseases. Uh, but the, the, you know, that's the result of a, a bunch of years of a real solid research and, and coming through an FDA um, IND or IDE pathway. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jerry Nadler, you have a question? Thank you uh, for a very nice, uh, very nice talk. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the diabetes stock in the, in the audience here. And so oh, I, it's very nice. I've seen some interesting data, uh, some preclinical and now moving into clinical with using stem cells for islet, islet oh, yeah. regeneration. That looks pretty interesting. I was wondering if you've come across any of those studies. Uh, I have actually, and I think that's a really, you know, of course there's a whole area of islet transplant, which is really exciting, but um, I think that this is really, you know, a good, um, a good potential for IPS cells and transdifferentiation. I mean, even adipose cells, there've been some papers published where you can get them to secrete insulin and glucagon uh, when uh, in, in a defined culture medium and you get them to go down that lineage. Um, so I, I think that's, that's an area where, you know, we're, we're another area where we may see some, some real breakthroughs, Again, especially with, with CRISPR-Cas technology and the ability to kind of re reprogram, do direct reprogramming of, of some of these cells. Thank you. Um, I believe um, Ralph had another question. Um, yeah, I just, it, it was in line with what was already asked, I guess, what was new and exciting and on the verge of approval uh, in, this, uh, in this field. But um, I think some of the other audience members already asked that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the problem is, to, is that you get things that can go into like phase two trials and then and then they can get to phase three and not, you know, not make it. <laughs> that happens a lot too, but I, I, I think there are a lot of really exciting things going on. And I think where there's good science to back it and where we have, where we're collecting good data, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's where really good things happen. I think where we get into these real ethical dilemmas is when people are hyping treatments that for which there's not a lot of evidence. And, and I think that kind of really degrades the doctor patient relationship. And in, you know, in, in an ideal uh, setting, uh, the person who is uh, recommending a regenerative or stem cell therapy to you is a real specialist in that area of practice and can, can help you size that up relative to all the alternatives. And, uh, and tell you, yeah, this is worth trying. So I think, I think at the end of the day for a lot of disorders, uh, these cell therapies are going to have a defined role. They're going to have a place. It's just not going to be, oh, they're going to cure everything. You're never, you know, it's going to make surgery obsolete. And, that, and that's how these are being hyped. I mean, I think in wound healing, um, I see a lot of potential. And yeah. maybe that's your area of expertise. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's an area that we, we've actually been doing a lot of work in wound healing with stem cells in our, in our lab, especially in a, in a pig model. And um, that's an area where, where this could really make a difference. I, one, one of the hats I wear is I, uh, I sit on the NIH, uh, NIDDK uh, steering committee for diabetic foot ulcer research and University of Pittsburgh is one of the clinical sites. And it's, yeah, we, I mean, that's, we have so, we have a long way to go in, in taking care of uh, bad chronic wounds. Um. Dr. Lawton, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, my, my, I, maybe I'm missing the main point, but you inject these stem cells. Do they remain undifferentiated and just produce the hormones they produce, or depending on where they're injected, they differentiate to a certain extent? That's a wonderful question. Um, so adult mesenchymal stem cells, at, at, as opposed to embryonic or IPS cells, adult mesenchymal stem cells pretty much stay undifferentiated, pretty much. They, they don't like to differentiate. They like to stay quiescent, which is a good thing, you know, because embryonic stem cells will form teratomas all over the place. Uh, so they basically are, are secreting growth factors and assisting in the healing process. And, you know, so it's a, it's a really great question, you know, where most adult stem cell therapies, we're, we're not asking them to differentiate. Is, is there any use? Is yep. there any research to uh, to make these differentiate or, or that's- Oh yeah, no, you can make them differentiate. I mean, we can, the problem is you have to hit them really hard with growth factors. So, um, 
you know, what a lot of people will do in, in they'll, they'll take a tissue engineering approach. So you take these cells and you, you put them in culture for X number of days in a very potent uh, defined media, uh, medium with a lot of growth factors uh, and then seed them on some kind of scaffold and then implant them. Uh, one of the things that we use in our lab in these tissue engineering models is we will encapsulate different growth factors in uh, uh, polymer microspheres and, and implant them with the tissue so that they'll have a delayed sustained release of growth factors over time. So you can do it, but that's, I mean, that's a harder ask uh, of, these, of these cells. I mean, the best we've been able to do, if you think about it in all the years so far of regenerative medicine, like what, what really works well doing that is, um, you know, bilayer skin substitutes like aflagraph from organogenesis. Uh, it, it's still, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to actually, um, you know, get something to differentiate in, into functional tissue. Anyone have any other questions? Real quick, just one other question. When you have a wound and um, sometimes stem cells get recruited to the wound, oh, don't, yeah. they, don't they undergo differentiation from the cellular crosstalk that occurs in the wound? Oh, oh they, they, they sure can, yeah. And, and you know where we see that the most is with angiogenesis and new blood vessel formation in the wound. No, I, I, I'm not saying they, they don't, you know, naturally these are gonna differentiate. So the reason we have adult stem cells uh, is so they can turn over the uh, end organ cells. They, they can, you know, start replacing whatever cells are over time in that organ, uh, whether that be fat, you know, even liver, they can do that to some degree. Um, but if you take them in bulk and, and you put them in, uh, in a living system, they, they tend to not just differentiate wildly. Absolutely. When you have homing to the site of injury, yes, those cells will differentiate. They'll participate in angiogenesis. Uh, but we don't understand enough about how to turn those mechanisms on and off reliably to do that with a whole mass of, of cells. Um, I mean, I, I can take a mix of adipose derived stem cells. I can put them in an endothelial growth factor and I'll show you beautiful pictures of these cells lining up in tubule formation. Um, but that's a lot different than actually, you know, making a new blood vessel. But these are, these are great, these are great questions. And it all seems kind of deceptively easy. That's the whole field of tissue engineering kind of started that way. Well, we'll just take some cells, we'll put them on the scaffold and life is good, you know, make a new kidney. Um, I, I trained in a lab um, at Mass General next to Jay Vacante, who was a very famous tissue engineer. And, you know, he was telling us in the early 90s, oh, Peter, you know, in five years, we'll have a kidney in a box, you know, and I, every <laughs> time I see him, I'm like, hey, Jay, where's our kidney in a box? It's like, you know, 30 years later. <laughs> but it's just, you know, I, I think we're making a lot of progress in the field. It, it's just we're, you know, not as as quickly as, as everyone might have thought at the beginning. Dr. Rubin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, very much appreciated. If anybody, yeah. no more questions, um, I guess we will wrap it up. So thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful That's evening. Fun. Oh, thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Peter. We were very much great, great seeing you. We'll see you at the meetings. And congratulations on all your work. And oh, thank happy, you. Have being president of the Plastic Surgery Society. Uh, we want to see you right up there with everybody. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to see you, Peter. Thank, thank you. you, Tara. Appreciate Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. To learn more about our educational programs and events just like the virtual events series, I encourage you to visit our website. While you're there, you can subscribe to the Benjamin Rush Institute's YouTube channel and link not only to all episodes in this series, but also to all of our past meetings, events, and conferences. And please consider supporting our work on behalf of the medical students we serve by donating to our efforts. Your support is vital if we are to continue to provide important educational programs and events just like this one. We appreciate your support, and please watch for your invitation to the next edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's Virtual Events Series.